Well, good morning. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's an honor to be here. Uh, in listening uh, to the speakers this morning, it was very interesting. A lot of analogies, a lot of good comparisons. Uh, in, in our country, we have a saying, once you've seen one tech transfer office, you've seen one tech transfer office because they are so different, not only around the world, but uh, in our country as well. Uh, just a little bit about the University of Florida. We are one of the 12th largest research institutions uh, in the United States uh, in a, how, and are in a very small community of about 120,000 people, city proper, about 250,000 metro. Uh, we have 50,000 students and we have 6,000 researchers. Um, very tough uh, criteria to get in the university. Only one in six of the students who apply actually get in because the criteria is so hard. And from a tech transfer perspective, uh, we at our peak year generated 53 million in licensing income. Uh, several of our patents have since gone off patent and so we're down to about 25 million. Um, that said, uh, Enrique mentioned that we weren't always that big, and so I'd like to just share with you a little bit of our transition, and I was asked to talk about the, the differences between small offices and large offices and what that tradition uh, kind of looks like. So yeah, I'll ask you to put your eyes on the slide because there is some animation that goes very quickly, but these are our humble beginnings. And when we first, this is a historic old building on campus. When we first started there, uh, we dealt with a rat infestation. Uh, the bricks were falling off the building. We had termites. We had a fire. And the thing you don't see here is we had a flood in the building. So all that to say, back then, our office was not very well respected on campus. Uh, we were um, put in the attic of this building and just something that the office, that the university had to deal with. Um, I remember when I first started thinking about going to work in this office, my back, I had been working for seven years for the NASA Regional Tech Transfer Center and my husband is actually a faculty member on campus and there were two people that I had to talk with before I took this job. One was my husband, because every time we would go out with his colleagues uh, and the Office of Technology Licensing came up, it was in between cuss words. It was that blank, blankety blank tech transfer office. Uh, couldn't help us do, get it, get, couldn't get anything right. The other person I met with was the Vice President of Research. Uh, and that's because he had just taken the position. And I wanted to be convinced that A, he was committed to fixing the office, which was quite broken, and B, I wanted to know what his metrics for success looked like. So I asked him, I said, if we do the things that you want us to do, how will you know we've achieved success? And he pointed to his inbox and said, see that? There will be a whole lot fewer complaint letters from the faculty. So that was his number one concern. But a little bit about small offices, uh, you know, I'm not telling you anything new here, but with small offices there's always so much work and so little time, right? So you really have to prioritize. And when I first came into the office, a couple of the things that we did that really made a difference was some strategic planning so that we knew that we were all on the same page. Um, because we can, we can talk about things, but even when you're talking about things, until you really focus it into a plan, when you're talking about things, you all still have different ideas of what that looks like. Uh, and in that plan, it helped us to prioritize um, what was really important with the limited resources that we had. And the other thing that was really painful was creating standard operating procedures. When I came there, there were three licensing officers, and every one of them was doing what they did in a very different manner. Um, and so bringing them in the room together and getting them to agree to talk about how their, what their approach was and then why they were doing it the way they were doing it, but then agreeing on what was the best approach amongst all of our folks. And to this day, we probably update our standard operating procedures at least 
twice a month, if not more, just because our world is changing. But our saying in, in the office is, if you don't want to follow the standard operating procedures, then come to us with a better way of doing it. Because if you've got a better way of doing it that is not in line with the SOPs, then the rest of us should be doing it that way as well. Uh, certainly budgetary constraints. Um, I think even when you're a large office, you have budgetary constraints, but they're particularly challenging with small offices because in the United States, a lot of the small offices have such a tiny patent budget that they have to actually find the licensing partner who's willing to put the money up to file the patent before they can file the patent. Fortunately, our office um, has long since passed that. Uh, this year, we're on track to spend probably between five and a half and six million dollars on patenting. The good news for us is on that money, we are getting back all but 1.5 million uh, from our licensing partners. So the other challenge in the small offices is the diversity of skills. Um, you know, in a small, when you're doing technology transfer, as many of you know, there are so many skills that are required. And when you have a small staff, it's hard to have that many skills. Uh, I'll give you an example. In our office, we have a very, very diverse campus. We get, this year we're on track to probably get about 340 new invention disclosures across all disciplines. So even with a larger staff, it's still very hard to have that expertise in all of those particular areas, and even more so for a small office. So what did we do? Well, we tried to leverage a lot of the resources. Uh, we went after federal grants, and in fact, uh, I currently have a federal grant from the Economic Development Administration, which is part of the Department of Commerce, that actually pays for four of the salaries of our people, four salaries. Uh, students are an amazing resource. We, at any point in time, have eight or ten students. The two primary things that we use them for are helping to write our marketing flyers, um, one-page descriptions that translates the science speak into the business speak, communicating the value proposition, and uh, make no mistake, that is a true talent. Uh, going from geek speak to business speak um, looks simple putting it in one page, but it's so not. Unfortunately, we have really good students who are very apt at that. Um, we also use the students to do prior art searches. So the minute a disclosure comes into our office, the first thing we do is look to see whether or not there's prior art already out there and what else is out there in that space so that we can get, then go back to the scientists and say, okay, you know, this is what you've told us, this is what we found, help us understand how what you have is different. From there, then we can go to the patent attorneys to give us further guidance. Now, um, I mentioned that we used to be off, you know, in this uh, attic and very isolated from campus. But more and more today, many of the colleges on campus are creating programs and incorporating our office into them <coughs> because they want the students to have experiential, real-world, hands-on experience. So by using our technologies in their capstone projects, um, everybody wins. The student gets a real life experience, and then the work that the student does, whether it's creating prototypes of the products, whether it's creating a business plan, doing market research, we, we get that value back in. And it also creates tremendous awareness amongst the students and the faculty who are managing these projects. Um, certainly, you heard a lot about entrepreneurship here this morning, and our Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation we work very, very closely with because I mentioned our small community. Because of our small community, uh, there's not a lot of licensing partners in our backyard or even in the state of Florida. In fact, in, Flo in the state of Florida, the University of Florida is the second largest employer in the state. Um, and in Florida and the United States in general, 99% of all the companies have fewer than 100 employees. And 64% have fewer than 10 employees. So when you talk about the importance of, of entrepreneurship and startup companies and creating jobs, in the United States it's viewed as, as where all the majority of all new jobs will be coming from. Uh, we used metrics from peer institutions to look at the size of the institution, 
um, the research dollars that were coming in, the amount of money spent on patents, the size of the staff, all to be able to benchmark against similar size institutions and as a way to justify getting additional resources. Um, and I'll talk more about the survey in just a minute. And then one of the really, really key things was to establish realistic goals. Uh, this is often where most of the conflicts come in, is when those goals are not established ahead of time and agreed upon. This is our new office. We are, it's a 50,000 square foot incubator, and it is absolutely beautiful. Um, Bob and um, Paolo have been to our office, so if you don't believe me, you can talk to them. Um, we, the only creatures that are in that office, besides our staff, are about two dozen startups because it's an incubator facility. And it's a, it's a, a I heard the, the expression for the first time about contamination. Uh, we talk about creating collision. When you create collision amongst smart people, amazing things happen. Um, and the, this facility allows us to expedite that collision. So by having our Office of Technology Licensing in this incubator facility, we get um, scientists and engineers coming into our office all the time who have these brilliant ideas. We get industry folks looking for licensing opportunities. We get entrepreneurs who are looking for their next, their next uh, opportunity to start a company. And we get investors who are looking to invest in companies. And just having this physical structure there as the focal point, as, as, in other words, as the innovation hub for the community, has meant an awful lot. We had been starting about 10, 11 companies per year. And for the last two years since we've been in this building, we've increased that to 15 startups per year. And our goal is to get over 20. Um, let's see. So we have uh, increased our size of our staff as well. Uh, we have 24 full-time people. And uh, this is just kind of a humorous picture with shades. We believe our future is so bright that we wear shades. So <laughs> staff just having a little bit of fun. Um, I mentioned that we had at 1.53 million. Right now we're at about 25 million in licensing revenues. When I first started there, we had 10 licenses and options. The last couple of years, we've had 85 licenses and options on about 130 technologies. So it's a very, very busy office with a lot of volume go th going through there. Now, being a large office, has its challenges as well. Um, that big, beautiful facility, everybody and their brother thinks it's theirs. They want to use it, right? And so we have to constantly be justifying our budget. How are you spending your money? Um, team cohesiveness. When you have 24 people working um, at a very, very fast pace and your staff changes all the time, keeping them all cohesive. In fact, I had more than one of our people say, you know, I, in some ways I liked it better when we were a small staff because we all knew what we were doing and we, we, grew up, we went out for drinks together and that type of thing. Once you get bigger, it's a lot harder to do that. But we have something called mission creep, right? So you've got all this staff and you've got this beautiful facility. We need you to help us with that. We need you to do all the MTAs. How about taking over the sponsored research agreements with industry? But guess what? The staff size doesn't grow with it. So we have to be really, really careful that more and more people want to utilize us for things that we are not being measured against. And thus, because we're not being measured against them and it's taking time away from what we are being measured against, it, it creates its challenges. Uh, resource envy, clearly everybody who comes into our building um, would like to have a space in the building. Uh, that said, part of the reason, uh, the, the building was actually built with an $8.2 million grant from the federal government because in the grant I convinced them that I would create companies that are creating jobs. So we have to keep the building for the startup companies. So we have to say no to a lot of space, uh, people who want the space. Um, and expectations. Expectations in a big, beautiful building like that. You know, we went from the, the rat-infested attic to this building, and the expectations are increased considerably. That said, keep in mind when we're in the rat-infested attic, 
We were making 53 million, now we're making 28 million, so guess what we're constantly being harped about? Money, money, money. So both, whether you're small or you're large, um, we share some common challenges, and that is we constantly need to make sure that we've got the support of upper administration. Um, and, you know, I always talk about how in tech transfer, we have many masters, oftentimes with competing goals because administration wants us generating revenue. Faculty want us giving them service and helping them bring in sponsored research dollars. Our industrial partners, you know, they want technologies that are ready for market, right? And most of what we have is very, very early stage and needs further development. And oh, by the way, oftentimes industry thinks that they should have it for free for some reason. Um, and then the whole idea of startups versus established companies in the United States, there's a huge, huge push on startups. We got involved in startups just because there were so few licensees in the state of Florida. So what are the keys, whether you're large or small, the keys to success of any size? Number one at the very top is communication with all of your constituents. Um, when we used to go out, my husband and I with his faculty, their complaint was they, they'd submit an invention disclosure and it would go into a deep, dark hole. They'd never hear from the Office of Technology Licensing again. So what we do is we actually copy our inventors on all the correspondence to the, to, as it relates to their technology. Um, they get all the correspondence that goes to the, attorney, the patent attorneys, etc. We really keep them in the loop. We also try to communicate on a regular basis with uh, our administration and management uh, in the way of newsletters, in the way of quarterly reports, so that they know what's going on. And we have a newsletter that goes to our external constituents as well, so that they see the exciting things that are happening in our university. Because the bottom line is, in the United States for many years, the life expectancy of a tech transfer director was five years. And it wasn't because that they all stunk at their job. It was because they were so busy doing their job, filing for patents, executing licenses, that once they got the deal done, they put it in the drawer and went on to the next one. And the companies were achieving success, but the tech transfer offices were not communicating those successes. And I don't know about how it is in Italy or other countries, but down home in the swamp, we call it, um, our faculty aren't afraid to complain. And so a lot of them complain a fair amount over the smallest of things. And so, you know, if you think about it, if you go back to our vice president of research, he wanted to minimize the complaint letters. Part of the complaint letters was he had no, none of the success stories. He had not heard about any of the success stories. So there was no way to balance you know, the complaints against the successes, right? So it's interesting because tech transfer people, many of them, many of you come from science and engineering backgrounds and law backgrounds. And this whole idea of marketing, you know, it's not really something you're comfortable with. But let me tell you, if you're not establishing your brand in a very positive, proactive way by communicating your successes, that means those people who are complaining about your offices, they're establishing your brand. And it's not the brand that you want them to establish for you. So very, very important. And then I mentioned earlier uh, establishing clear goals and goals that you set but that are also agreed upon by your, your management. So that's a great transition into just a very brief on, on setting goals and uh, metrics, realistic measures. We can't talk about metrics in the United States without first mentioning the Bayh-Dole Act. The Bayh-Dole Act in 1980 is what actually created the profession of technology transfer. Excuse me. It gave the universities the right to take ownership of the intellectual property that was developed from federally funded research. And it obligated us to proactively protect the research and to seek commercial licensing partners. Now, all that with no additional resources. So um, we, we started from nothing. But I will tell you that before Bayh-Dole, the federally funded research, there were about 28,000 
invention disclosures that came in from federally funded research, and very, very few of them ever saw the light of day. Very few of them, in fact, no drugs at all were ever commercialized out of that federally funded research, which, by the way, was life sciences was the largest portion of the federally funded budget. So Autumn was mentioned earlier. Just a real brief on Autumn, which I have the honor of being the president of. Um, it has uh, over 3,000 members, and uh, we do an annual survey, and the survey uh, generates some interesting results. Just to give you, this is 2012 data, 23,000 invention disclosures. I won't read all the numbers, but you can see a lot of activity goes on, and these are actually um, underrepresented um, because about only 200 institutions actually respond to the survey. Interestingly enough, the survey uh, also uh, uh, indicates that there are over 705 companies formed in 2012, uh, with over 15,000 employees being reported from just 7,000, um, from just 70 institutions. Uh, bio, the Biotech Industry Association also does a survey. Um, you can see the metrics here. Uh, in terms of the economic impact on the GDP, on the economy of the United States, it's quite huge. It's Our, one minute. Okay. Um, so, I'm not going to talk about RTI. I do want to talk just real quickly. When you're looking at measuring success, there's economic impact. Keep in mind, revenues, taxes, jobs, tech transfer offices don't have a lot of control on that, right? We license the technology, and that's up to the companies to achieve. The social impact, same thing, but in tech transfer, it's not just about the money, it's about whole new industries, cures for diseases, the reduction in healthcare costs. Our uh, greatest success story, Gatorade, created a sports drink industry that is now $7.4 billion industry, started right in Gainesville, Florida. This is little uh, Emma Whitehead. She is now in complete remission from leukemia based on a technology that came out of the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, hospital acquired infections, 100 people die every year in the United States from hospital acquired infections. We have two technologies coming out of the university, one of them a hospital surface manufactured by Sharplet, another one a hand washing technology that have the potential to greatly reduce healthcare costs. 3.5 million children die every year from hunger. Dr. Burlog from Purdue University has developed a number of wheat varieties, and he has been credited for saving more lives, the single human being for saving more lives than any other human being in the world. And I would tell you that uh, Autumn has a Better World program where you can find many, many stories like this, because we believe that while jobs and patents and all of those numbers are important, the real reason we do what we do is to improve the human condition. And we hope that nobody ever forgets that. So I apologize that I went over on time, but thank you very much for listening. Sure.